Hi, I'm Nikki. Welcome to Alpha. Life is busy. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? What's happening today? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions. Like, why am I here? Where am I heading? Is this it? Is there more to life than this? These are life's big questions. But there's rarely enough time to think them through properly. We all have different perspectives on the meaning of life and faith. And Alpha is an opportunity to explore life's big questions. This is a great place to come together and talk about them openly and honestly. I'm Gemma. I'm Toby. And this is Alpha. Whoa, that's a big one. If there really is a God, and I was able to ask one question, why I wasn't Duncan when I was 10 years old. <laughs> that's a good one. What's next? That'd be my question. I'll probably ask me the, um, the winning numbers on the lottery number, probably. <laughs> so I can go and retire. What's heaven like? I'd probably ask him what is he scared of. I don't think I would ask God a question, because I don't want to know. What happens when I die? Can I come back? Why couldn't my parents stay together when I was a kid? How did I get on this path that I'm on? What their plan was for all this, and whether or not we, uh, we lived up to it. Am I doing this right? How'd I do? How'd I do? <laughs> That's what I'd ask. How'd I do? If what I'm doing is kind of like aligned with my purpose in life, I would ask God, are we cool? I guess the ultimate question would be why? Why this and not nothing? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why the struggle? I would ask him why he made life so hard sometimes. Friends of mine told me that the first night they came to Alpha, they sat in their car for half an hour, waiting and watching people going in. And eventually when they'd seen enough normal looking people going in, they thought they'd give it a try. And one thing that might be going through your mind is, am I gonna be the only one there who doesn't believe all this stuff, who's not a Christian that doesn't go to church? Well, if that's you, then you're in the right place. Alpha is designed for people who wouldn't call themselves Christians or who are not regular churchgoers. It might feel a bit strange to be discussing life and faith with people that you've never met before. But the best thing about Alpha is often the great friendships that are formed over the weeks. For much of my life, I was not remotely interested in Christianity. In fact, I didn't think I'd ever come to something like Alpha. I was not brought up as a Christian. My father was a secular Jew. He was an agnostic. And my mother didn't go to church. Uh, and I had no interest at all in Christianity. First of all, I just thought it was so boring. Everything to me about church, Christianity, religion was just dull and dreary. And it kind of made me feel a little bit guilty. I didn't know why, but I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And I also thought it was untrue. I, I thought I'd sort of thought it through and uh, I'd come up with these intellectual objections and I call myself very pretentiously, I call myself a logical determinist. And I quite enjoyed arguing with people who called themselves Christians. And at university, I had a bit of a reputation for being an argumentative atheist. And I also thought it was irrelevant to my life. I couldn't see how someone who'd lived 2,000 years ago, 2,000 miles away, could have any relevance to my life today. It just seemed outdated and irrelevant. But at the same time, Looking back now, I would say something was missing. I say that because I don't think I was living in the moment. I was always looking forward to the next thing in life. So when I was at school, I was thinking, when I finish my exams, maybe that will be when I'm gonna really start to enjoy life. I finished my exams, and then after about three weeks, I started to think there's gotta be more to life than this. And I thought, well, maybe when I've left school, that will be what life's all about. And then I left school and after about three weeks, I started to think, there's got to be more to life than this. I thought, well, maybe the answer is to get a girlfriend. And somehow, I don't know how I managed it, but I managed to find a girlfriend. Again, after about three weeks, I started to think, there's got to be more to life than this. And, and basically, there was something missing. I was longing for more. The actor Jim Carrey once said, I wish everyone could get rich and famous and have everything they've ever dreamed of. 
so they would know that's not the answer. Some people dream of having their name in lights, of fame and fortune. Some people dream of finding happiness through relationships, careers, money, whatever it may be. But do you ever get that niggly feeling that as good as those things are, there must be more to life? Yeah, all too often life just doesn't turn out the way we think it should. And even when it does and we achieve our wildest dreams, it's somehow never quite enough. It just doesn't satisfy. It's like there's something missing. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In other words, I'm the one who fulfills the longing that's deep inside every human heart. Jesus claimed to be the one person who can satisfy that spiritual hunger. Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of the rock group Queen, had amassed a huge fortune and attracted millions of fans. But he admitted in an interview shortly before his death that he was desperately lonely. He said this, you can have everything in the world and still be the loneliest man, and that's the most bitter type of loneliness. Success has brought me world idolization and millions of pounds, but it's prevented me from having the one thing we all need, a loving, ongoing relationship. Ultimately, there's only one relationship that is totally loving and goes on forever, and that's a relationship with God. And Jesus said, I am the way to that relationship. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. As of lately, a lot of picnics. Traveling, games, and fishing. Yoga, poetry, kissing. Love, love fishing. Skateboarding. Basketball. Basketball makes me happy. You wanna go first? Uh, love. Yeah, love is good. Shopping. Coffee. That's an easy one. Meeting new people makes me happy. Positive energy, people around me. Vacation, food, puppies. Getting my nails done makes me happy. <laughs> music. I was gonna say music too. Oh <laughs> Something that I create. God makes me happy and nature. Nature. Biking around. A good sunset. Connecting with people. Looking at trees and everything and looking just, it's just all a miracle for me. Feeling like I don't have any pressure on me. It makes me happy. Feeling like there's some purpose like in my life. A good nap. Good food, working out, and spending quality time with my family. I think that's a good answer. When I was about 17, I was sitting having a burger with two friends, and we were looking out the window and commenting on a few of the stores across the street, and I suddenly realized that I couldn't read any of the signs, even if I squinted. So I asked if I could borrow one of my friend's pair of glasses, and as soon as I put them on, I realized I could see everything, like colors, shapes, words. I was amazed at how everything was so clear. And I could see before, but now I could really see. And to me, that's the best way to describe the difference that Jesus makes. Jesus is the lens through which we see God. And he's also the lens by which we see the world in a totally different way. Jesus said, I am the truth. Some people's response to a Christian might be, well, it's great for you, you found meaning and purpose in your life, but it's not for me. But when you think about it, that's not actually a logical position, because if Christianity is true, it's of vital importance to every one of us. And if it's not true, it's not great for us, because it means we're deluded. C.S. Lewis was one of the great intellectual giants of the 20th century, probably best known as the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. He said this, Christianity, if false, is of no importance and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. I come from a family of lawyers, so naturally I wanted to look at the original documents and sources. I never really looked at the evidence before, and I was astonished at how much evidence there is for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. For me, it was through reading these documents that we find in the New Testament that I came to the conclusion, it's true. One of the last cases I did as a lawyer was in the Court of Appeal in front of Lord Denning, an absolutely brilliant mind, perhaps the greatest judge of the 20th century. He said on one occasion that his Bible was his most tattered book in his library. He'd examined the evidence really carefully, and he came to the conclusion, it's true. One former professor of history at Oxford University described the resurrection as the best attested fact in history. I hadn't realized how many of the pioneers of modern science were believers. Descartes, Newton, Kepler, Galileo, Locke, Copernicus, Faraday, Kelvin, Pasteur, 
Francis Collins, one of the greatest scientists of our time, was director of the Human Genome Project, mapping the three billion letters in the human DNA, considered by many to be the most significant scientific undertaking of our time. He describes how he encountered Jesus and came to believe in the truth of Christianity. Well, in the home where I grew up, uh, faith was not something that was talked about very much. Uh, my father was a professor of drama, my mother a playwright. Uh, when I went to college and those discussions in the dorm late at night about religion uh, began to occur, I had no particular reason to attach value uh, to a faith system. It had never been something I was familiar with or had internalized at all. And I assumed that any religious feelings that anyone held must be on the basis of some emotional experience, and I didn't trust those, or on the basis of some childhood indoctrination, uh, which I felt I was fortunate to have missed. I loved the experience of learning about the human body and all of the components of that, and I particularly loved being introduced to genetics. But then I ended up in the medical school curriculum sitting at the bedside of patients with diseases. This was no longer an abstract study of molecules and organ systems. These were real people. And one afternoon, one of my patients, a wonderful elderly woman, much like a grandmother uh, who had very bad heart disease. Uh, she had a particularly bad episode of chest pain uh, while I was with her. She got through it, and at the end of that, explained to me how her faith was the thing that helped her in that situation. She realized that the doctors around her weren't really giving her that much help, but her faith was. And after she finished her own very personal description uh, of that faith, she turned to me, and I had been silent, and she looked at me quizzically and she said, what do you believe, doctor? And ultimately I had to admit to myself that her question had made me realize that I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. If there's one thing scientists claim they do is to arrive at conclusions based upon evidence. And I hadn't taken the trouble to do that. I was greatly assisted uh, by a pastor who lived down the road who I went and asked about all this and who gave me a copy of C.S. Lewis's wonderful book, Mere Christianity, because here was an Oxford scholar, a prodigiously developed intellect, who had traveled the same path. Within those pages, I realized for the first time that one can come to belief on a rational basis and that, in fact, given the many pointers that one sees around oneself in terms of the universe and it having a beginning and its fine-tuning in terms of the way in which all those constants that determine the behavior of matter and energy seem to have been set just in a certain very precise range to make life possible uh, and many other things including my beloved mathematics and why they actually work anyway to describe the universe something that makes you think the creator must have been a mathematician that brought me then to the person of Jesus Christ as a person who was historically extremely well documented. That was news to me. I thought Christ was as much myth as history and I realized after reading more about it, this was a historical figure upon which we have a great deal of evidence for his existence and his teachings and even his rising from the dead in a literal way. That day at uh, my patient's bedside started a journey for me, a journey that I was reluctant uh, to begin, but I felt I needed to, a journey that I thought would result in strengthening my atheism, but to my surprise, resulted in my conversion. There's a difference between knowing facts about someone and really knowing them personally. Now, I've known my husband, Phil, for three years now, but suppose if, before we met, I found him on a website called The Amazing Man. Now, there's no doubt I would have looked at him and thought, OK, I'm intrigued. But what if each page was dedicated to his amazing abilities, his sparkling personality, his tender heart, his extraordinary intelligence and his cooking abilities? Well, I would think, wow, he does sound like an amazing person. But that's head knowledge. But I also have the privilege of being married to him and I know that he's an amazing person, which is knowledge that comes from the experience of a relationship, and that's heart knowledge. When Jesus said, I am the truth, he was talking about more than just the kind of intellectual truth. 
the Hebrew understanding of truth was truth as experienced. And there's a big difference between a kind of intellectual knowledge and a personal knowledge between your head and your heart. So when someone says, I know Jesus is the truth, they're not just talking about being convinced of the evidence. They're also talking about experiencing a relationship with the risen Jesus Christ. So Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. And lastly, he said, I am the life. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came to deal with the things in our lives that stop us from enjoying life to the full, the things that spoil our lives. I hate shopping, I loathe it. I, I think I'm allergic to shopping. But occasionally my wife Piffa persuades me to go shopping and just after Christmas, uh, it was the sales and she persuaded me to go shopping. We went into the shop and we bought this very nice new sweater, the uh, same color as all my other sweaters. And um, we left the shop and we went to buy a present for her. And we went into this ghastly shop. It was so crowded, it was unbelievable. And even Pippa had had enough and she said, okay, we're leaving. So we went to leave and as we left, the security alarm went off and the security guys moved in very quickly and they stopped us all from leaving. And like the crowd that was trying to leave was stopped and the crowd that was trying to come in was stopped. And we were there right in the middle. Uh, the six of us who were going through the security at that one time were all taken off and sectioned off from all the rest. And they wanted to see which one of the six of us had set off the alarm. So they sent one of them through and that was fine. They obviously hadn't set it off. Then they sent the next one through. They obviously hadn't set it off. Then the third, then the fourth. None of them set it off. So it was left with Pippa and I were standing there and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm married to a shoplifter. It must be Pippa who's got set off the alarm. So they sent her through and she didn't set it off. So I thought, oh my goodness, I've obviously got something. Someone must have planted something on me. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be sent to prison. All the crowd were watching, both sides. They were just watching this criminal who'd been caught going through. So they went through and as I went through, the alarm went off. They took me to the side. They opened up my rucksack on my back and there they found this sweater from the other shop with the tag still on it. I felt so guilty. That was like false guilt. I also sometimes experience true feelings of guilt because I do things that are not right, that are not good. And this is the wonderful news that God loves you and he loves me. God came in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and for me. And on the cross, he took all of your guilt, all of my guilt, everything you've ever done wrong, everything I've ever done wrong, said wrong, thought wrong, and he died in our place in order that we could be forgiven. And forgiveness, C.S. Lewis said, it's like a, a recording of our life wiped completely clean. And when we receive that forgiveness, we find life and life in all its fullness. And that's what Jesus wants for you and for me. Life in all its fullness. Life at its very, very best. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. And it was as if that all I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. And I don't want to do this thing called life. I don't want to do it on my own. And it kind of feels like my longing for this, this light inside is now stronger than my fear of what others might think. And people often ask, well, doesn't that make uh, faith like a crutch? And, you know, well, maybe, but, you know, what does a crutch do? Uh, a crutch helps you stand and it makes you stronger. And in that case, you know, sure, I need a bit of that. But especially when it's so much more than that, when this faith inside is also, also like a backbone, uh, helping me stand tall and helping me be strong when I'm really up against it, facing those odds, whether it's on a mountain or stuck in some jungle or just dealing with the storms, you know, with the storms of life. Uh, sure, I need it, I, you know, I, I need that. Uh, but at heart, my Christian faith says that I am, that I'm known, that I'm known to Christ. Uh, bought at a price, uh, blessed with light, 
Uh, faith says that we're loved regardless of our mess, uh, regardless of how many times we fall down, and that Jesus somehow picks me up. And sure, you know, I'll reach out to that. Why, why wouldn't I? I used to think Christianity was boring, untrue, and irrelevant. But when I read about Jesus, I realized he was anything but. Jesus said he's the way to God. He's the one who brings meaning and purpose to your life. He said he's the truth. He said he's the life, that true fulfillment is found in a relationship with God through him. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. Now, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. And over the weeks ahead, we are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning. Think of it this way. If you live to be 70, you're going to spend 20 years and three months asleep, 10 years and five months watching TV, five years and nine months in some form of transportation, seven years and six months eating and drinking, you have approximately 570,000 hours left to live. So why not spend less than 24 of them asking life's biggest questions? Welcome to Alpha.